This Choircast podcast is brought to you by Heretic Happy Hour, whose tagline is burning questions, not people. You know, we've been around for a long time now, and we've had many different lineups. And Heretic Happy Hour is only getting bigger and better with guest hosts like Rain Wilson, David Bentley Hart, John Fugel Singh, Candida Moss, Elaine Pagels, and of course, December Rose. 2024 and 2025 are turning out to be our best years yet. So check us out on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. It's Heretic Happy Hour. We hope to see you soon. boys and girls, mums and dads, welcome to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist and next to me in the virtual space, my friend, mentor and person I go to to ask questions especially about cars and things these days is Uncle Brian McDowell. How are you, Brian? I'm good, mate. Um, we've had quite a lot of car questions this week. We've had questions around um, fitting a tail light to your wife's car. We've we've talked about car leases. Um, yeah, there's been lots of lots of car talk. Very blokey, un, unlike us. We're generally not that blokey type talk, are we? I don't know. I remember you were always pretty car. I don't know. Not not, not obsessed, but you're always really big on your car. That's why I go to you. When it when it comes to cars, because of the way you've always been about cars, it, it's funny. I'm not I'm not a person like if someone said, "What's your favourite car?" It's just like I don't care. It's one with four wheels. I don't I don't really I'm not obsessed. And I'm a as you know, I'm a motorbike rider. I have a couple of motorbikes, and I love getting out my motorbike. And when you stop somewhere and people want to talk motorbikes, I'm like I'm lost. I, I don't really care. I like riding the thing, but I I hate talking about it because I'm not one of these rev heads. I'm not. I'm, I'm just not. I I just have an interest in these things, and I can fix them. I'm fortunate enough to be able to fix them. So I think that's where you may think I'm a bit of a car type guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, being able to fix cars pretty much makes you a car type guy. I think, Brian. Well, you know, Troy, you are more of an IT boffin than me. So most cars now are more IT than mechanics. Mechanics is a thing of, of old. Most cars now, you take them in for a service and they plug them in and the computer does the work. So I think you are the future. Yeah, that's right. I, I often say that, that driving my EV is like driving an iPhone because it is. And and I think that's why all of a sudden now I'm more of a car person. <laughs> I think you are. But l- enough about cars because people are probably just ready to switch off. Although, you know, hey, we've never had car talk before. So Welcome to Brian and Troy's Car Talk, people. Today, we've got a very exciting guest, and yes, we do say exciting a lot, but I am really excited about this one because it's going to dig into a bit of a, a, a theme that has come up, I think, over the years. But firstly, I want to introduce to you Dr. Laura Anderson, who's a psychotherapist, a trauma resolution coach and consultant. She's a writer and educator specializing in complex and developmental trauma, Dynamics of Power and Control, and Religious Trauma, based in Nashville, Tennessee. So Laura may even sing us a country song. We're not quite sure. Um, But Laura's book, When Religion Hurts You, takes an honest look at the side of religion, the messy stuff, the stuff that we all have definitely got experience with, having experience with, have gone out the other side of, and that is her focus of her therapy and practice. And in the book, she wants her readers to understand what religious trauma is, but also isn't, and how those high controlled churches and religious groups can be harmful and abusive and often result in the mess that we always find ourselves in. The, one of the reasons we're having Laura on today is that um, one of our wonderful, wonderful people volunteers with um, the podcast. Lucy sent us a substack of Laura's, which basically the essence of it was that when we leave fundamentalism, that all too often fundamentalism doesn't leave us. And it manifests in other ways. And when I say manifests, I do think of demons. And no, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about demons here. Um, so we are going to unpack this and talk about it more. But firstly, 
I want to welcome Laura Anderson to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Hey, before we get into any of the sort of, you know, deep and meaningful questions, I want to ask you, is Nashville still the center of Christian contemporary music like it was in the 90s? It still is very much the center. I, I don't know. If, I guess I should say, I don't know if it's the center of it, but it is highly populated with, uh, you know, Christian musicians. But what's interesting and what was a shock to me when I first moved here almost 15 years ago is that who they portray themselves to be on the albums and at the shows and, you know, big worship concerts is not really who they are in real life. And I think one of the first couple of weeks that I lived here in Nashville, I was at a house party with several musicians from well-known worship bands. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, this is what their real life is. Because I just watched you like raising your hands on stage. And this is very different. So I, I had a rude awakening or immersion by fire into finding out that the the Christian music culture is, is they, you know, they don't live, eat, breathe, and sleep Jesus all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Laura... Uh are we talking about cocaine off a crucifix right now, or what? Are, what <laughs> are we talking? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Be because that yeah. is still holy. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, you know, Brian, because you were saying that. Is it? Uh, that's exactly what I was thinking. Are, you, are we talking like cocaine off someone's ass? That's what I was going to say, rather than cocaine off a, a crucifix. But we both straight went to cocaine. Yeah, <laughs> and crucifixes. So you know, yeah, very holy over here. At least you know if you're doing the the non Jesus stuff with the Jesus p paraphernalia. It, it basically evens each other out and you're good to go. So that is life in Nashville. So Troy and I have a, a past friend from many years ago. This is Jared Troy. Um, so he, I still am friends with this guy on Facebook and he is a Christian musician and goes to Nashville a couple of times a year. So I'm all, he's always tagging people going, hey, back in Nashville recording with another Christian artist that I've never heard of, another Christian artist I've never heard of. So I can say from the outside, it definitely still is a bit of a hotspot. Yeah, yeah. It's everybody comes here, you know, which, I mean, it makes sense. We're a music city. We have all the things and we're we're fairly tiny, you know, compared to our reputation. So, um, you know, people come here, they love it. They think that it's music all the time. And for some people it is, but um but it's, it's just an interesting city to be a part of. Lots of uh, Peter Pan men, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> that's always fun. Yeah, and un unlike New York, you don't have the naked cowboys, so, you know. True. <laughs> we do have a lot of bachelorette parties, though, and so it's not naked cowboys, it's naked cowgirls. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Okay, moving on. Laura, got a question for you. We ask all our guests were you a teenage fundamentalist? I was kind of half ass, but well, actually, it would depend on which half of my adolescence and teenage years we're talking about. Because the first half, I really tried to rebel against it. And the second half, post graduating high school, which was when I was 17, uh, definitely was a teenage fundamentalist. Just jumped right into it, unfortunately. Oh, no, no. Fortunately, otherwise you probably wouldn't have written this book. You wouldn't have been an expert. No, no, we're very happy. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> as, as an expansion of that, like, tell us a little bit about Laura Anderson, who she was growing up, um, the family, the environment that led you to basically move into that teenage fundamentalist space and what ultimately brought you to write When Religion Hurts You. Yeah. Well, you know, even though I didn't buy into the fundamentalism in my teenage years, it was something that I grew up with from the day I was born. Um, really, the story is like I was born on a Tuesday and by Sunday I was in church and just never left pretty much. Um, my dad was the director at a fundamentalist Christian camp uh, starting when I was in elementary school. So we moved there. We lived there on site. As you can imagine, there's like the upsides of camps. You know, I had a ropes course and a lake and a 
horse corral literally in my backyard. Um, but it's also very isolating. There's a lot of, you know, strict dress codes, at, you know, how you can act, what you can talk about, things like that, relational uh, things that you have to abide by. And so I kind of, for a while, lived this double life. I had my camp life and then I had my school life. I did not I was not homeschooled. I, I grew up in in the United States in a blue state, which meant that the education system was much better than in some other states. And my mom is an educator um, by training. And so she obviously valued that as well. Um, and so we, we went to public school, which I now see as kind of like a saving grace um, and just a way that I was able to be allowed to see other things and the, a world outside of fundamentalism. Um, but as you can imagine, since camps don't take place in big cities, they take out place out of ways. Um, we were pretty isolated. We lived about 30 minutes, um, from really anything usually is more like 45 minutes. Um, and then we, you know, family was two and a half, three hours away. So, um, yeah, it was kind of this weird, weird, weird world. I was also involved in church, but did not really care for it. We went to a fundamentalist church as well. Um, and I think because we were so heavily involved in the camp, it kind of took the place of having to be really, really involved in the church. Um, until I graduated from high school and quote unquote made my faith my own. Uh, at which point, you know, I really had to jump in and give every extra moment of my time to that. Um, I also grew up really like in the beginning of purity culture. Josh Harris's book uh, was written when I was in high school. I signed the True Love Waits pledge card. I had my purity ring. I you know, really dove into that. And my senior year of high school in particular was when I was realizing I'm going to have to do this quote unquote, make my faith my own thing. And so that means I'm going to get married right out of high school. I'm going to start having kids. I better start to become the godly submissive woman that I'm told I have to be in order to find the biblical leader man that I'm supposed to be with. Um, which was hugely conflicting to me because I I did well in school academically, athletically, musically. I got a lot of scholarships to colleges, but ultimately decided to stay at home because a, a good Christian woman didn't need an education. She just needed to bear children. Um, so I, quote unquote, passed the time by going to a community college. I figured I'd do a year or two there, learn how to you know, get some administrative skills if I needed to go work an administrative job in case my future husband ever fell on hard times. Uh, I would have some skills. And while I was doing that, I was also volunteering a lot at the church that I was going to and eventually started working there full time. Um, and that was my first overt experiences of spiritual abuse. I didn't have language for it at the time, but I, I knew in my body something's not right here, but also couldn't express that. Couldn't, I didn't have a way to say, hey, something's going on here. I tried. The first time I experienced uh, uh, overt spiritual abuse, I was literally being screamed at by a pastor accusing me of things that I had never done. Um, and I was like, this is not, this is not okay. But he ended that by saying, if you tell anybody, like you're disobeying your spiritual authority because I'm a pastor and I could not hold it in me. I went home and I told a family member and they were like, you shouldn't have told me. The pastor told you not to. I told my direct boss, who is my pastor. And he said the same thing. You shouldn't have told me. This person said no. Um, I thought that was what they called church politics. But it turns out, no, that was spiritual abuse. Um, and it just kind of went on from there. So I worked in that job for three or four years uh, full time. I eventually ended up quitting because I was dating a person that the church leadership did not approve of. Now, we weren't doing anything bad. It was like full-fledged purity culture relationship. Um, I think the furthest we went physically was like he kissed me on the hand or the forehead, or maybe both. I don't know. Uh, real scandalous. Um, but we weren't doing anything that would constitute this like sinful reason for breaking up other than the church leadership did not approve of the relationship. And they, as a result, because I worked at the church, they just made life miserable. And they would have people watching me. They would have people reporting back on me um, because they didn't trust me. Anything that anybody else said was taken as 
fully truth. And so even to combat it or try to defend myself was not an option um, because I was considered already dangerous and sinful and really made to believe that simply by dating this person that they didn't want me to date, I was living in sin. Um, But it got so untenable that I finally ended up quitting. And it took me years and years, over a decade after that, to realize that the reason they were so upset with me was not because I was dating somebody, but because they were not in a position of power and control, because I was asserting my own voice, my own will, and I was saying, I want this thing here, and they were losing control over me as a result of it. But that was what kind of got me out of like the heavy church influence. Um, I still tried to do this path of repentance and trying to get back in the good grace. I was terrified that I was no longer under the protective covering of the church and that the devil would be out to get me. Um, But as I was going through that process of repentance and trying to restore my character and my name, I was also working for the first time at a secular job at at a um, college. And I was having this different experience where I was respected for the things that I did. They didn't care what I did on the weekend. So long as I got my work done, that's all they cared about. Like they didn't want to know about my life. They didn't want to have say into my life. Um, They encouraged me to climb their corporate ladder because they saw I had skills and talents. And so me being a woman was not a problem. Um, And it was just a very different experience. And ultimately, I well, I hated the job, but, um, but it gave me this different experience to know that I could have more. It led me back into uh, school. I already had my bachelor's degree. I went back to school, got my master's degree in marriage and family therapy. And about halfway into the program, I knew that I had to choose either between literally just suffocating in that community or moving somewhere else. And um, by the time I was done with my master's degree, I then had a degree where I could move anywhere. I could get a job anywhere that I wanted. I wasn't confined to having to work for a church because my undergraduate is in Christian ministry, uh, which as a woman, you just really can't do much with that. Um, And so I... the about three months after I got done with my master's degree, I moved here to Nashville. which was great. I eventually opened my own practice and people started coming into my office describing spiritual abuse, describing the trauma that they were feeling and experiencing and their symptoms. We didn't have language for it though back then. And, and so and living in the South of, of the United States, it's literally like, hey, what's your name and what church do you go to? It is just baked into our culture here. And so nobody was talking about, hey, these are the clients that I work with or whatever. I had already been deconstructing uh, myself, but also thought maybe I'm the only one going through this because in high control religions, you're made to believe that if you have a problem, if you doubt, it's you. It's definitely not the system. Um, and so they're coming into my office kind of in secret going, oh my gosh, I walked into this store and they were playing worship music and I had this like fight or flight response. So I was starting to recognize it as trauma, both in my clients as well as myself, which is ultimately what led me back to get my PhD and several of the projects that I did in my PhD program. It led me onto Twitter one night to ask people, hey, what would you want your mental health practitioners to know about religious trauma? I'm going to create a resource for that. And And then I started meeting other people that were doing the same things with their clients that led me to co-found the Religious Trauma Institute and eventually open up my my practice or a bigger practice. I already had my private practice, but I opened up the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery because the need for this was so great. And that, of course, was around the 2020 elections here in the United States where we were just seeing between 2016 and 2020, this massive outflux of people from high control religions that were just highly disillusioned by what they were hearing in the religious and political conversations. And yeah, somehow just started doing podcasts, got a book agent, book deal, all the things. And that's like probably more than you wanted to know, but also the tip of the iceberg. (laughs) So ask away if you have other questions. No, no, it was, it was great, but there's just so much there. Do you know what I mean? Like there were so many times I'm thinking, okay, should, should I let her finish or should I jump in and ask this question? Okay, I'll let her finish. So because there was just so much there. I mean, let's go back to talking about this church. How do you think, you know, coming from you, your family, 
how how much of that were, were you prepared for, meaning that you had actually been conditioned for, and how much of it was brand new to you in spite of your upbringing? There was a lot that I was prepared for um, because I had grown up with that same theology. So it was a very like uh, reformed theology, Calvinism. Um, so the idea of me being a worthless human being, like not even deserving the air that I breathed, you know, like that was already baked in. But in terms of like the minute details of what that looked like to live out, that's where it was a bit of a shock to the system. Every move that I made was scrutinized. It was a huge surveillance culture. Like I said, purity culture, we didn't call it that back then, um, but it, that was really coming onto the forefront. And so there was this idea that the holier that you were, the more likely it would be that you'd end up in this godly relationship. So it meant that my life was becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And that I was not prepared for because the message just wasn't, there until like my senior year of high school, where, you know, we have true love waits and we have I kiss dating goodbye. And we have all these actual materials now of books saying this is how you're supposed to live. But I dove right into it. Um, and I think part of it is, um, and maybe this is a larger conversation, you know, purity culture, or any systems of control really target adolescent brains, you know, about age 15 to 25, because that's when we're the most impressionable. And we have the hugest amount of ego. So we think we're right. And so they target this age and they go live this way and then go preach it to everybody else and go get married and have kids and preach it to them as well. And so I was I was in it. I, I really embraced it. Um, and I also didn't have a choice. My job was tied to it. So I knew that if I didn't fully embrace it, I was going to lose my job. I was going to lose the community that I was around. I would lose respect. I, my character would be tainted. And I, at you know, age 18, 19, 20, I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't know what I would do if I lost all of that. So there was absolutely moments where I was like, I don't think this is right. Like, I, I think that life is bigger than this or more than this, but I had nowhere to go with that. I wasn't ready to be out on my own simply because I knew I'd lose everything. Um, and I think that's a, I think a lot of people get caught in that as well. It's just, it's such a familiar story in so many ways, unfortunately. It's, it, it's frightening. That surveillance, I mean, I, I was, I was part of that a hundred percent. Like you were absolutely thinking you were doing the right thing as well. That's the insidiousness of these types of cultures and communities that you think you're actually doing God's work, but you're not, <laughs> you know, you're becoming part of that locus of control. It's just, it's really, really frightening how easy it is to slip into it. And as you've explained, you weren't consciously necessarily doing it, but you knew what the cost was to not do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think people forget that too. I mean, there are pastors and ministry leaders that come into the faith later on in, in their life and then assume these roles of leadership. But so many more are people that have come up through the system and are just regurgitating the things that have happened to them. And they don't know any different. Like that's all they've ever experienced. And they're passing it on as the love of God or, you know, the holy righteous way, like there's never been a time where they haven't had that sort of teaching. And so there isn't always this malicious intent to control. And yet it is extremely controlling. It's extremely dehumanizing and it's extremely harmful. And I think in most cases abusive. Um, and so it's, it is odd to come out of those cultures where you were being perpetrated against and then became the perpetrator of those things. It's like this dual uh, process of healing um, because, yeah, I mean, you're trying to heal yourself as well as have compassion for those you harmed and, and needing to sometimes be a part of their healing process as well by offering, um, you know, your amend or trying to make amends with them, um, which it's a lot. It's a lot to do. Laura, one of the things that we, you know, Brian mentioned before was that you wrote this substack about leaving fundamentalism, but fundamentalism doesn't necessarily leave us. Can, can you tell us about that? Because this is something that we have seen. We've seen it in ourselves. We've seen it in others. But, but let's, let's dig into that. What, what did you say in the article and, and what's your thinking on it? Yeah. So the, the 
uh, term that I coined is called embodied fundamentalism. Um, most of the time, people think of fundamentalism as this very cognitive kind of construct. So it determines what we're thinking about, how we act, how we do things. But it really is a, it's a way of living. It helps our nervous systems try to find at least the illusion of safety. When we think about fundamentalism, it's very rigid. It's binary. It's a box. It's you here's the right way and the wrong way. Here's yes, here's no, black and white thinking. And when that is the way that we're living over time, it doesn't just stay in our brains. Our brains create neural pathways that send chemicals down into our bodies so that we have a physiological response to whatever is going on. So it could be as simple as like, you know, the pastor gets up and looks at you with that look and all of a sudden you just immediately feel guilty because you know he is going to tell you and convict you of something that you did right or wrong according to this list of rules and this way that you're supposed to live. And and so over time, those neural pathways get stronger, very, very subconscious where we're not even having to really think about it. And there's just a way that you do life and a way you think and a way you relate and dress and behave and every aspect of your life is inside of this system. And there is one right, right way and everything else is the wrong way. And on top of that, we're usually taught that those people who do not believe the way that we do are dangerous, are out to get us, are going to pull us down. There's, I'm sure there's other messaging that goes with that too, depending on the denomination or religion that you are a part of. But there's this message of fear that it, that goes with it. And then the reward is, and if you do these things, then you go to heaven, you get this eternal reward. Um, and so it's very polarized. So when we leave a system like this, and, and it could be a religious system, it could be some sort of other ministry, it could be a cult, it could be a high control group. Um, when we leave that, we might say, okay, I do not believe that stuff anymore. Co on a cognitive level, I reject these theologies, these doctrines, these rules, and and you really mean it. But what happens is like just because we shift our minds cognitively does not mean that our body has had time to catch up with that. And so we we tend to move towards other fundamentalist systems, other systems that tell us, here's how to live. Here's the right way to do things. Here's the good way. Um, not because we're looking to be controlled, but because we've never been taught critical thinking skills and fundamentalist thinking and living feels safer to us. Again, that's the illusion of safety, but it feels safer because it feels familiar to us. And so then we oftentimes find ourselves in different scenarios where we are preaching, but just with a different message where we're just as religious, but a different group that we are ascribed to. And when that happens, um, we perpetuate the same things that we did inside of religion. Um, and so that can be very polarized thinking. It can be very us versus them. It can be very extreme, um, kind of like in or out, you know, here's what you have to do in order to, to be a good person, to be on the right political party, to be in the right group, to be doing the right diet so that your body is the healthiest or whatever we're still operating because our bodies are still operating under that uh, fundamentalist kind of physiology. And until we actually look at that and seek to disembody how that fundamentalism lives inside us, we are very prone to create the same dynamics in relationships, systems, and how we live our lives. We intuitively know this, don't we? That because we talk of the, about this a lot in our group, that we say you still have the black and white thinking, and that's the language that we use, right? But it's not just that; it's also this us and them in and out kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when we're in fundamentalism, familiar is what is safe to us. So it could be this is the way we think; these are the people we hang out with; this is what's right or wrong, and we look for as humans, we seek. When we believe like if this is familiar, then this is safe and functional for us, even if it may not actually be familiarity in our physiology registers as safe. And so, you know, we in a lot of religions, we're not taught to find safety within ourselves or find stability within ourselves. We're taught to find that externally by following rules, by following a person, by following this Bible or these doctrines. And so when we come out of that, we don't necessarily have critical thinking skills, relational skills, ways to regulate ourselves, soothe ourselves. And so we only have 
with us these coping mechanisms that we've developed inside of fundamentalism, which means we just transfer those and we go, okay, who's the Who's the loudest voice in this discussion? Um, what's the person that's showing the most detailed step-by-step path that helps me achieve goodness or greatness or the right body or, or the right political party or whatever? And again, not because we're wanting to be controlled, but because we don't really have the skills and tools. We've never been taught them to do anything other than that very rigid black and white or fundamentalist thinking and relating and living. It, it's really interesting what, um, I mean, there's a lot of commentary around this, particularly over probably the last decade in particular, that we're seeing um, larger margins in between the left and the right. You're seeing these extreme left, extreme right, and both ends of the spectrum are claiming that oh, nothing shifted, this is where it's always been. And this is a bit of a, a, a personal thing. So consider this a counselling session and charge me, Laura, but I've always considered myself a progressive left-leaning person, but I'm finding myself getting further away from what the, the new left is and because I'm seeing such an enormous intolerance with both the new left and the new right, and I'm only talking about the, the left because that's where I've always leaned to. So I would probably be considered within that spectrum moving more towards the centre, but I don't think I've moved. I think I'm still sitting in that same progressive left space. So you've got all these extremisms happening. What's your take on what's happening there and and how do people actually identify that and try and work out where they sit? And because what I think happens is it's, a bit of a magnet. If you're sitting in that place where you've always been progressively left, you feel this pressure to be sucked right up to this extremist point and all of a sudden you find yourself there and there's such an intolerance, such, there's a lot of hate there. Yeah, I I identify with that so much because I I would describe myself very similarly as well. I kind of look at it as this spectrum. So on the, you know, let's say whether we're talking about religion or politics or whatever, um, we go, okay, so we're coming out of, you know, this one side of things. Our natural human tendency is to swing to the other side of the spectrum, but just with, it's like doing the same things, but with the opposite belief, right? So if you said it's yes, then now I say it's no. If you say it's good, now I say it's bad, right? And so we're not actually thinking for ourselves we're doing the opposite. So it's highly prescriptive, right? Uh, You know, when we're in religion, everything is prescribed to us. And doing the opposite of that or standing for the opposite of that is not necessarily freedom. It's still prescribed because it's the exact opposite of what we were taught, right? So we're still not developing critical thinking skills. We're not living for our own, through our own values. We're not finding a balance point. And sometimes we do have to swing to the other side of the spectrum just to like give ourselves a different way to move and live. But I tend to say that neither side of the spectrum is sustainable for actual living and life and relationship and connections because it is so extreme and it's based on being highly activated all the time. Um, You know, hypervigilant, active, you know, I think about like in high control religion, it's like you're always having to be alert and aware and ready to defend at any point. And the same is true on the other side of the spectrum. It's just defending against something different, you know, whatever you were not, you know, whatever the truth was that you were defending against, now you're against it. Um, And so I'm, I do think that sometimes we can take things from both sides of the spectrum and say, hey, this thing really worked for me, or, oh, I really appreciated the freedom I had in this space or that space or whatever. And we can pull from that. But generally speaking, we not need to find a place to balance But that is the harder way because it requires critical thinking and curiosity. It requires us to find safety within ourselves instead of just going to the external resources. It requires that sometimes we have to have hard conversations uh, with other people or even just with ourselves to say, okay, what do I truly think and what do I truly believe? And is it okay if I, you know, don't agree with people? Is it okay if people don't agree with me? Can we still be in relationship even if we don't agree entirely? And, um, 
but that is the harder way. Um, and, and it's not sexy either. It's like, it's boring and it's difficult and it's, it's hard to be there because it requires that you don't just listen to the loudest voices. It requires that you employ, you know, thinking and learning skills. It requires that you take an inventory of yourself always, you know, it, it requires an open-mindedness to change. Those are things that are not taught or held as values on either side of the spectrum. Um, and so it can be much easier to just kind of go with the flow because then at least I don't have to think. I just, oh, this is what we believe. Okay, great. That's what I'm standing for. And, and sure, that might be appealing for a little while, but I would I would say that that's not necessarily life. It's not necessarily living. And it certainly isn't living for yourself. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's usually where I fall on that. No, no, I do think it answers it. And I, I just think it's a really difficult thing to not only balance, but ha- because what, what often happens is people just keep swinging to the extremes and they don't, they're not able to find the middle. Like the middle is a really difficult place because people don't feel like they're standing for anything. And are they principles based? All of that sort of stuff. So I think it's a difficult thing to, to actually sit with because it is self-examination and we're not good at that because self-examination is incredibly confronting Um, and and it's something that generally when we truly sit with it, we know that it needs some sort of response from us, some sort of change um, for good or for bad. So I don't think that's an easy thing to do. Have you got tips for that, how people can actually do that and how they can test those spaces? Yeah. I mean, it sounds maybe simplistic, but the first is to be very, very patient with yourself. This is like a new skill, kind of new muscles that we're learning to flex and to start in small doses. Um, you know, part of the extremism is we kind of cannonball into these pools and we just take them on full force and balancing it out. It, it We sometimes need to do that in small doses and it can be everything as, as silly as this might sound, but first within yourself of going like, I need to figure out who I am. What do I like? What do I not like? What are the things that I've been saying yes to because I've been told to say yes to them or because I've been told that's the only answer I have or no to because that's the only answer I have. And even looking for the little areas in your life that you can challenge that you've just done out of habit or pattern and start putting some critical thinking. Am I doing this because this is what I believe? Am I thinking this because I've done the research, I've done the homework, and and now I've come to this conclusion? And if the answer is no, well, then we might invite ourselves into curiosity. Could I read a book or listen to a podcast of opposing viewpoints? Could, or, or, or where multiple viewpoints are shared on a certain issue. Could I let myself um, consider what if what if this person is right? And what if this person is right? So this sounds like a silly example, but the way I did it for me, which allowed me like a nice starting point is um, I watched the TV show, The Bachelor. Um, it's my guilty pleasure, but I don't feel guilty about it. Um, but this was years ago. So probably, I don't know, close to 15 years ago. So there weren't all the podcasts and everything that we have today recapping the show. But I would watch The Bachelor and then I would go read all the blogs the next day. People would write these blog recaps and I would notice that I would get really upset at people who had disagreed with my opinion of what I thought this person was or that outfit or this or that or whatever. And I was noticing this in myself and I thought, okay, what if, what if it's okay to be different? What if it's okay, you know, that, that they have a different opinion on this or that, or they don't like this person. And I do like this person. And so I started to let myself sit with discomfort over something that was rather meaningless, right? Who actually cares about what happens on the bachelor? But I, I, everybody, Laura, (laughs) everybody cares about this. Well, then find a show that doesn't matter to you as much. Um, but but find a show that has an, enough room for like multiple opinions. And so what I started to do is I would just let myself sit with the discomfort of like, oh, this person doesn't like it or doesn't see this the way that I see it. But maybe they are, are right a little bit. And maybe I'm right a little bit. And can multiple truths exist? And can it be okay for differing opinions? But, but that doesn't mean that it is 
that this person is dangerous or sinful or whatever. And I just started to kind of grow my tolerance to sit with difference and to sit and to allow maybe my opinion to be changed because, oh, I, I didn't think about it that way. And that changes how I might think about this over here. And it was a really neutral way for me to do it because, like I said, the the Bachelor or maybe other shows don't have this greater meaning to them. They're just a silly show that we watch. And that then was something I took and I started to implement it into different areas of my life uh, with people. And, oh, yeah, this person has a differing opinion. Um, I might not like it. I might notice that I'm getting really defensive at first. But if I let that down just a little bit and listen to them or practice empathy, so that's not necessarily agreeing or that with them, but just simply standing in their position and seeing it from their you know, through their eyes, you go, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense why they would think this thing. That doesn't mean I have to think that way. But all of a sudden, I'm seeing them as a person with more complexity rather than just the enemy who thinks something different. So that was where I started finding something re relatively neutral and meaningless and letting myself sit with differing opinions. And I still do that to this day. I listen to a lot of recaps. So I stay sharp in the sense of going like, yeah, I'm just letting myself come in contact with different is that I can then remember to let that discomfort work through me. One of the things we talked about recently, we had um, Sharon and Tracy from the Feet of Clay podcast on, and we were talking about how there seems to be a set of beliefs that you hold to when you are deconstructing. You know, and this is that sort of, you know, wanting, running from one extreme to the other or, you know, the opposite. And it becomes, I am a non-Christian. Here's what non-Christians believe when actually non-Christians are, you know, extremely diverse. And it's almost like as much as Christian is a label, then not Christian becomes a label. And there, there seems to be, yeah, a group of beliefs that people buy into. H have you experienced that? Have you, do you see that in your own practice or in your own, you know, movements in the sort of deconstruction space online or otherwise? Yeah, I remember it It doesn't always feel as prevalent now, but I would say for probably a period of three, four years, there was kind of this like statement of like, well, to be truly deconstructed, here's where you end up or here's where you land or, you know, you're not really deconstructing if you're not also, you know, deconstructing this or that. Um, or if you still accept these parts of the faith, you haven't really left. And, and I, from like my perspective as somebody who works with the nervous system and who understands fundamentalism, I had a lot of compassion. I got it because they were trying to create safety and to say, again, sameness equals safety. So if you're going to say you're non-Christian, then it means you have to believe these other things. That means you're safe to me and I need you to make me feel safe. So it's, it's again, same kind of messaging and how it lives in your body, just a different kind of uh, title or label. And um, I still see that to an extent. And I think in some ways it's normal and sometimes where, where we simply just have to start, right? Because when we were taught, here is the right way for literally everything. Um, and then we reject that. We say no to that. Sometimes the only skill we have is to go to the opposite and say, oh, so then a non-Christian must mean this thing over here. Or to be a faithful person is this, but to be a deconstructed person is this. And, and sometimes that's just where we have to start and we create or frame this new ideology. What I would say though, is if that's where you start and stop, I don't know that you're deconstructing or disembodying fundamentalism. You're just leaving that ideology behind. And that's where I really differentiate between like deconstructing as a cognitive philosophical concept and then healing from trauma as a physiological embodied process. And people oftentimes make the two the same. And I would say they're, they're different, but usually unless you do both, you're going to end up being a fundamentalist in another area of life. And, and how does that affect, for example, how people forge new relationships, make new connections? How does it affect their relationships going forward if they're not able to tackle that beforehand? They can be real messy and really um, extreme. I, I can think of so many times, and I did this too, early on when I was resolving my trauma, where take the concept of boundaries. Uh, in most religions, <laughs> we're taught boundaries are like this list of rules. Here's all the things you can do and you can't do. 
I don't think that's what boundaries are, but that's what we're what what we're kind of ingrained to believe. And when we come out of that, a lot of times we hear this new concept of boundaries. Oh, boundaries, it's how I stay safe and blah, blah, blah. And typically what happens is people start off at going, here's my boundaries and they're extremely rigid. They're very much rules based. Here's the things you can do and you can't do. And I need everybody else around me to follow my set of rules in order for me to feel safe. Which on the one hand, I can appreciate that you're going, okay, I'm trying to feel safe. And if I can feel safe in a relationship, then it, you know, it allows for all these other things. But that also does not actually create relationship because then we are now just having to succumb to a set of rules. Otherwise, I'm going to be de- deemed a, a unsafe person or somebody that you'll cut out of your life because I haven't followed your rules. And it also doesn't give me then room to show up as myself. I'm showing up as the way that you want me to. And all of a sudden that's sounding very familiar, right? And so I think that it really does impact relationships because even though we might have the best of intentions of like, I want to do things differently, um, we're still kind of playing by these old rules. And what we see then when we're actually resolving trauma is that over time, then those boundaries become more flexible and they become my responsibility to put into play. And they become something that um, maybe I don't have to be so rigid with them because I know how, if I know how to find safety in myself, then I don't need you to pr- provide that for me in order to show up. I can actually give that to myself. And then that allows for other people to show up as themselves. And it, I think, allows for actual authenticity, actual intimacy, actual connection, and a deeper relationship. So what does that mean, though, for those of us that have been rejected by churches or have felt Mm. rejected by churches, when we come into these sort of communities, how do we express our own opinions? How do we, you know, stand up for what we believe? And I'm talking even within sort of, you know, the deconstruction space within, you know, Mm -hmm. websites, within, um, uh, you know, Facebook groups and things like that. How, How do we stand up for what we believe when we're facing that? you know, the repercussions of the trauma. Mm, I think it's so hard because I've been a part of many like post-religious, like online groups and stuff. I think one of the hardest things is everybody's at a different place in their own journey and what safety is for them and what healing is for them may or may not be the same for another person. So that could mean that something that I find to have been very helpful to me and something that was pivotal in my own healing or the place that I'm at now could be extremely um, triggering for somebody else, or they could maybe not be able to tolerate that and vice versa. And I think what's hard is that when we are, when we've come out of being hurt by other people, Um, even though we need other people to heal and to help us on this path, other people are still pretty scary to us. And in those fundamentalist systems, we are taught, it is ingrained that difference equals danger. Again, it's one of those things that simply because I leave that church it doesn't mean that that is not living in my body. So then somebody comes on a you know Facebook forum or something like that and said, oh, actually, I, I disagree. That was not helpful for me. That practice wasn't helpful for me, but I'm trying this instead. And instead of it just being like, oh, that's so great that you found something that works for you, it's now seen as a threat. You are against me because you have disagreed with a thing that is helpful for me. And I I wish I could say, just do these five things and then you're going to be good. And every, you know, social media group is going to be super easy to deal with. It's unfortunately not that simple, but that is part of, it's, it's part of the, you know, we need this community outside of some of these religious spaces, but that can be the downfall is that there's a lot of very traumatized, raw people that, um, for good reason are struggling and, and being in a group like that can absolutely trigger some of that. And so if there's, you know, if there's anything I could say is like, if we can give people the most generous assumptions that a, we're probably not trying to trigger other people and they're not trying to trigger us. We're both just different people having different experiences and try to lean into that curiosity that can be helpful, but it is often very, very difficult when we're coming out of spaces like that. 
It most certainly is. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and look, I think it's a lifelong struggle. I don't think it's just, um, you know, your mm-hmm. first year or two years coming out of those spaces. Right. I, I think it, it's life and particularly mm-hmm. in an environment that we all live now where there are, are so many differing views and so much is permissible, so much is taboo, um, the extremes are so great. There's just God, it's it's just really difficult for people to navigate without mm-hmm. the overlay of of religious trauma. So mm-hmm. one thing yeah. that you did begin to touch on before was purity culture, and mm-hmm. you started to talk about you know d- definitely the um, the trappings and that. And I want to say, Laura, you're a Jezebel. You got somebody to kiss your hand, probably the <laughs> same hand that had your purity ring on it. I mean, it's probably it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's your own undoing. So please don't start to. To try and look like the victim here. Jeez, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Uh, you yeah. put it on yourself. I know. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally, yeah. <laughs> I deserved it all. Deserved everything that came my way. <laughs> you did. No, you didn't, of course not. But the really unhealthy view of sex and sexuality that, that people leave fundamentalism with Again, it's mm-hmm. another thing that you have such an extreme response to. I am going to completely mm-hmm. rebel against this. I'm going to throw all of the rules out. And again, it leads to more unhealthy behaviours because we have extremes. And this mm-hmm. isn't just about religion. I mean, there's, there's so many overlays to it. But how do people, after leaving religious fundamentalism, reclaim sexuality and pleasure? And I know you talk about this in your book, um, but how do you do that in a healthy way? If I could have my way, not saying that I'm the, the the right person on this, but if I could have my way, it would be slow down, slow down. Um, and I say that because most of us coming out of this, these cultures, we're in our 20s, we're 30s, 40s, 50s, right? And we're like, oh my gosh, I'm a sexual being. I have sexual urges and drives and desires and Apparently now they're good and I can act on them and it's great. And, and it is great. That's the thing. Like, it's awesome. But when we are taught, this is bad, dirty, sinful, do not engage with it unless it is in this very, very specific context. Again, our bodies are living that message out. It's not just in our minds. So when we reject that, in some of the more extreme cases, we have people whose bodies are responding the same as people who have been sexually abused and assaulted because it's like a light switch. Uh, all of my sexuality and sexual experiences are off and then it's on. And I've never touched myself. I've never engaged with my sexuality. It has been bad, dirty, evil. And then all of a sudden they turn it on and my body has this very visceral response. In some cases, it could be things like sexual pain, vaginismus, erectile dysfunction, and a whole host of other things, uh, physiological and psychological happen. And the research that's coming out is affirming all of the anecdotal evidence. I had so many people, um, I I supervise other therapists and I would have them coming into my office going, this client is presenting as a sexual assault victim, but they swear they were not. And I knew enough of what was going on living in the South. And I said, hey, did they grow up pretty religious? Did they grow up in this thing called purity culture? And they were like, they did. And I said, all right, let me tell you what is happening in their bodies. Our sexuality is is lifelong. We are born with it. We are inherently sexual beings. And I do not mean just who we have sex with, whose genitals are up against whose. We are sexual beings, meaning that it is the life force within us. It, It gives us passion, drive, motivation, joy, creativity. It impacts every area of our lives. And it is there from the time that we are born. And it, I view it as like a, a dimmer switch on a light, you know, where you can like slowly turn it up. And if we are developing health in a healthy way, sexually, as we grow up, that dimmer switch gets a little brighter and a little brighter and a little brighter with every stage of life that we're at. So by the time that you are having uh, a sexual relationship with somebody, your body, your mind, they're prepared for it. They've been kind of warming up to it. When we look at people coming out of purity culture, as well as people who have been sexually abused, specifically children, um, it's like the light, it's like a light switch turning from off to on. We don't have that gradual warm up. And so our bodies then are responding as if they are in danger because 
in cases of sexual abuse. They absolutely are. But when we've been told, don't turn this on until this very specific moment, and that's ingrained within us, then our body has the physiological response to match that. So when I say slow down, it's that we need to let ourselves go through that sexual development pro- process, usually for the first time, and to come in contact with ourselves, with our bodies, to understand what pleasure is, and it's not just a sexual thing, to realize I have a body, this thing is a body, and this is good. And I would love if everybody could take, I don't know, like six months to a year and get in contact with themselves and even learning like sexual self-pleasure without shame, without guilt, before they're engaging with other people, not because I'm trying to put rules around it, but because I go, when you can do that, then you're at this better place to be able to experiment, to have fun, to engage in relationships where your body is more primed to not view that as dangerous or to not view this as something that is covered with guilt and shame. Um, so that would be ideal. But if, if you're like, yep, too bad, been there, done that, there still are ways that you can come back and learn some of this. And it is, you know, just, it can be simple things of finding pleasure in non-sexual things. You know, maybe it's in a piece of chocolate or a scent that is really beautiful to me or non-sexual touch with yourself or with a partner um, where you're just really learning, oh gosh, I really like it when my uh, back is scratched or when somebody's running their fingers through my hair. And so it is going back and kind of redoing, or in some cases, doing for the first time, what it was that we missed out on. Of course, that can be a more complex process also, but usually when we talk about reclaiming our sexuality, it's really starting at the basics and learning like, my sexuality is who I am, and and re-engaging with this this whole part of ourselves that we were cut off from and is so much bigger than who we are having sexual relations with. I'm actually drawing parallels with what we were talking about in the first half of this discussion. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people leave fundamentalism and uh, I, I use this word tongue in cheek, but it's still a good descriptor, is we just sluttered around. You know, we got out of it and just went bang. And, you know, you're talking about on and off. And it's the same thing we talked about before with this, you know, going from one extreme to the other. And it's almost as if, well, I don't think it's almost as if you, you're saying to us, hey, it's it's the same kind of thing, discovering who you are, discovering what you like, but being slow about it and not going from extreme to extreme. Would that would that be a good a good way Absolutely. to have seen this? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we see it a lot in the area of sexuality because on one side, we're extremely repressed, we are shut down, and then we go, okay, the only thing I know to do then is the opposite of that. So turn on, act out, do all these things. Um, and that's not nec- it's not I, that's not a bad thing in terms of like, here's what you should or shouldn't do, because everybody is a- allowed to do what they want, so long as it's consensual and legal and safe, you know. But but it's this idea of like, when we have this one extreme, then typically the only other options we feel we have is this other extreme over here. And again, I would say probably not the best place to, to land at, because with that too, we look at them, there's usually an increase in like sexually risky behavior. Um, Um, you know, there's most of us haven't received like any sort of sexual education, understanding safer sex, understanding consent, any of those things. And so we end up engaging in things that maybe do have like really negative physical and psychological impacts. That's where we start to see a lot of people experiencing sexualized violence or even accidentally being the perpetrators of that because they don't know that they're supposed to ask for consent. They don't know how to gauge that because they've never been taught how to or or how to give consent. And so we do end up seeing then that though it might be liberating and it's like, oh yeah, I can just like go do whatever. You can. Um, you are allowed to, but there's also some potential prices to pay in that because we are just in very unfamiliar territory and you might be 45 years old, but you're behaving like a 13 year old because that's all you know how to do, you know, and, and we were cut off at those ages. So it makes sense that that's kind of where we would be at when we're re-engaging with it at a different time. And that's a prime example of what we were talking about before, that people that have left 
uh, maybe a long time ago and have maybe found a middle ground and have a more nuanced view of sexuality, people that have just left are thinking, oh, that's the old thinking. And actually, it's not the old thinking at all. No, 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 it's not. And that's why I say like sometimes when we have these two sides of the spectrum, there could be some really good things on either side that we could take and put into our balance. So I look at the one side and I go, oh, you know what? There could be some benefit in having my own personal rules for myself or my own ethic for myself from one side, right? I'm not gonna take all the rules, all the boundaries, all the everything, but I'm gonna take the idea and the concept. And from the other side, I'm gonna take freedom and liberation. And I can marry those together because it does allow for safety, intimacy, connection, and living from a place of self-value versus simply doing what is prescribed or the opposite of what is prescribed, which is basically prescribed. Yes, I think uh, I think we've all been through trying to strike that balance, and and it is certainly a yeah. yeah. It's a, look, it's a, it's a really difficult thing, and and I think many of us have regrets. I know I have regrets, and you hurt people along the way when you're trying to to find what that pretty tricky balance is sometimes, but come back. To- yeah, that's why I said we slutted around. Did you notice? I was I used that language. I didn't say they, right? Because, hey, uh, I was Oh, I was a- absolutely. I was and, um, you know, I mean, it, it is a natural thing and it's a natural thing to want to mm-hmm. in some ways make up for lost time because you feel like you're ripped off, particularly if you lost your teens, 20s and 30s to fundamentalism. Yeah. It's like... Hell yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm getting out there and I'm going to sow some wild oats. So you Mm -hmm. do that and you learn to Mm -hmm. turn the light switch on and off and can be a bit heartless about it too and Mm -hmm. inconsiderate of other people's needs because Mm -hmm. you're trying to fill the needs that you feel um, that you were ripped off from. So Mm -hmm. completely come back to what you were saying before also about being kind to yourself maybe I'm going through a, uh, a thing that shall pass too, um, but I've got to be kind to myself on the way through and kind to others I think is most important too. Yeah. It's interesting mm-hmm. too because I think part of the, you know, the initial leaving and that reaction and I heard someone say it's like a spring that's tied up and then, you know, it just goes boing, boing, when you know, comes mm-hmm. comes loose. Sorry, those of you that can't see, I just <laughs> did a visual of a spring. Um <laughs> I think sometimes too, we forget that there are other people because we're so wrapped up in ourselves and our own pain and our own reaction. And this is what you were saying, Brian, you know, there's, there's sometimes regret looking back, but I think actually understanding that people out in air quotes in the world, there is, we can even leave and go out there going, okay, I'm not part of the church anymore and forget that they're not people in the world. <laughs> they're people. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so too, not just sexuality, I'm talking about the way that we're responding to people as well. And and I I found this really valuable, Laura, because I think you've put words to a lot of what I have been trying to put words to or trying to describe to others as well. Because when I look at our Facebook group, sometimes I even think, you know, and I I help start the group, I I think to myself, oh God, I don't want to really say what I think here. Because if they th- thought that I had a nuanced view of sexuality or gender identity or or anything like, I mean, those are the, the hot button issues in society, let alone in our group. Um, you, mm-hmm. know, you sort of got to, I feel sometimes I sort of got to be a little bit cagey and, and hide what I really think. And that's frustrating for me because that mm-hmm. just smells and feels like church. And that's sometimes where I just think, oh, I'm taking a break from the group, you know, just walk mm-hmm. away and come out here into the real world where I can be who I really am. And and mm-hmm. I think that's something worth considering. And I say this to people that are in our group, our Facebook group that are listening to this. Wouldn't it be nice if we could really be ourselves and not tear each other down, especially when our views are shifting and changing as well? Like what mm-hmm. I say today may not be what I think tomorrow, and yet we do still want to cut people off and shun them almost, even in the online, you know, mm-hmm. scenarios or in the online mm-hmm. online context. And and that troubles me. And that's why I really wanted to mm-hmm. talk about this, right? Because mm-hmm. I I think mm-hmm. this is something that affects me. And, and I left church in 1999. Yeah. Yeah. It's so unfortunate. It's deeply painful. I've I've had that experience actually happen recently of showing up in a way that was different than what somebody wanted me to. I didn't have the response. I mean, they and they literally told me, "You did not respond the way that I thought you would. I'm done." And and that was, you know, and this was a a, a 
person who I knew and, um, and it was, a, and they, they rallied a few other people to do the same thing. And we forget like that is, that's deeply painful. And, and I, as I was processing through this with another good friend who also grew up the same way that we all did and was a pastor and, and, you know, I said, I, I have not felt this way since leaving the church. Uh, and specifically the church that I grew up in where it, it ended very badly. And, um, and he has had some of those experiences as well. And it just felt, oh, it just, it hurts in, you know, because it's, it's not just that you're losing somebody now it's that oh, I feel the same way as I used to back then. And I was hoping that that would never happen again, you know, and, and here it is that it does. And, you know, and I want to be compassionate and, um, because I, I think that it is this like healing is this lifelong process and we just are kind of going through it and we're living it in every moment. We were not taught skills of how to deal with difference or how to deal with conflict. Um, and that still shows up in spaces like this where we immediately go, you don't believe the same way as I do. We're done. I am cutting you off. And I'll probably make it big enough so that I can get some other people to go with me and get them against you too. And, and it just, that's called uh, a church split. Laura. Yeah. That's yeah, what that's called. Exactly. Right? And that's Thank where you. they learn that. Right? Yeah. We have a Facebook group split or we're going to have a, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. And I just think fundamentalism is such a well-worn groove in our minds that it is never difficult to slip back into it. And yet the moment that we do, real hurt and pain happens in our real lives and relationships. And it's just, um, it's really heavy and difficult to go through. Um, so I, I feel that on a personal level, I've witnessed that as I watch different social media spaces. And the thing is, is that I wish like we would all do well to know that there will be literally zero other people on this earth past, present, or future that will ever agree with us entirely on every single thing. So that means it is up to us to learn how to deal with difference and to learn to expand our tolerance and to not boil people down to one issue or one problem or one conflict, but to lean into complexity and nuance. Um, and I just, I wish that we could all do that more, myself included. I know that I do it too. Um, I'm on the dating apps, so I absolutely quick judge people. You know, hey, if you got a fish in your picture, immediate le left swipe. I know everything I need to know about you, right? So I have to work on it too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, it's we would do well to lean into the complexity of humans before so quickly judging based off of something that is different. Yeah, and and I think cutting ourselves some slack too. In in the history of humans. Right now, we're expected to have an opinion about just about everything globally because we've got all of that at our hands. A yeah. hundred, hundred and fifty years mm -hmm. ago, we're expected to have an opinion on what Joe Bloggs was doing next door and that was about our world was mm -hmm. the size of a village or our local town. Now it's global mm -hmm. and we don't have mm -hmm. context either because a lot of the time it's just right. who is reporting that story and you are making a judgment based on that. So it's, you know, a bit of fact-finding stuff mm -hmm. too where people don't do that because they're, they're fed what they need to believe. It aligns mm -hmm. with their values and they go, mm -hmm. yep, that's my opinion on something that's happening in the Ukraine or Poland right now or something like that. But we don't have the context. Yeah. We've got no idea. So we're yeah. expected to be experts yeah. without the tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Even living in Australia, we we are, you know, are you team, team Democrat or are you team Republican? Um, you know, we don't even have a choice to vote, right? We're not involved in this, in this process. But I, I laugh at that because most Americans don't vote either, right? So even though they can, um, but yet we are. You know, here in Australia right now, we are watching the American election ramp up or the, you know, the pre-election campaigning and we are taking sides. Um, and that, that's, you know, gosh, that, that wouldn't have happened once before. We just would have waited for the outcome, especially when we were younger, just would have waited for the outcome and here's the new American president. Do you like them or not? Whereas now we are following this. We are, we are you know, pulling up stumps and drawing sides. 
Yeah. That is the thing that I get the most pushback for on social media is why aren't you speaking to XYZ issue? Um, and they're, they'll say, you know, you're a religious trauma expert. You should be speaking on what's happening in Gaza. And I'm like, I am a religious trauma expert. Why would you listen to me on what I think about what's happening in the Middle East? I do have my own opinions and I have conversations with my friends. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what you should like... be saying, what you should be saying, Laura, there is, um, you know, I'm a trauma expert. I don't have an opinion on Gaza. If, if I did have an opinion on Gaza, then I would probably be an actor or a singer because that's who we listen to most in our lives, don't exactly. we? Exactly. What's Leonardo exactly. saying about Gaza? Yeah. Quick, tell me what to think, Leo. Exactly. Tell me what to think. Yeah. And that's just it. I'm like, and I've told people, I'm like, unless, like, if you're coming to my page, if you want to know what I think on trauma, religious trauma, kind of those areas where I have lots of letters behind my name, where I have done tons of certifications and trainings, and this is what I do. Like, if you must listen to me, listen to me on that. But if I am like, hey, here's this cancer treatment, here's this other, like, why would you listen to me? I am, I don't matter. I don't matter. And you should not care enough about what I think that it gets you all like fluffed up. And yet there's this demand, like you must tell us that you're safe by siding with me on XYZ issue. And I'm like, I just will not, I won't do that. I, and people I know they're like, well, then you're an unsafe person. I'm like, okay, I'm so, an unsafe so, so person. So, <laughs> Laura, what is your view on vaccinations then? No, I'm kidding. I'm your kidding. Your body, we don't your choice. Know. Yeah, no, we don't want to know. We listen to Jenny McCarthy. Very yeah. good. Very good. Yeah. Laura, mm -hmm. this has been such a good chat. It's been so much what we wanted mm -hmm. to talk about for a really long time. Really, really valuable. And thank you so much. And I hope people listening are also, you know, finding value in it as well, because it's, it's just so much of the journey and it's so much a part of the journey and yet it's often hidden from us. And it's very easy, you know, even in this, I'm thinking, oh, it's very easy to talk about what these other people are doing in the Facebook group. I'm doing it. I'm doing it still, yeah. you know, and I've been out mm -hmm. for 15 years, oh, sorry, 25 mm -hmm. years and I still do it. So, you know, I'm not casting aspersions on too many other people without casting them on myself, but it is something that we need to watch because who wants to be a fundamentalist, even though you don't go to church? Not me, mm -hmm. not me at all. Yeah. It's not fun. It really isn't. Your life becomes so, oh, boring and you're hypersensitive and to everything. And there is, yeah, and small. very small and there's no joy. There's no joy in that. It's really You, not you heard fun. it first here. There is no fun in fundamentalist. Even though it may look that way, there is not. So believe the truth. <laughs> now, I, I do want to encourage our listeners to read your book um, and, yes, When Thank Religion you. Hurts You, and also to have a look at some of your resources. We will put links to your Substack, um, also to your website, should people want to, to connect with you. Now, for some of our listeners, most are based in the States, but they are based globally because we're the global pastors um, of this movement. Can people um, book in, have online appointments with you? Is there an ability to collect, uh, connect in wherever you are around this globe? So yes, the answer is yes. I um, I offer, uh, because my client list is full, I offer a different kind of uh, appointment. It's called a mini intensive consultation where you can come and work with me for a couple hours on whatever you want to work on. And then I can help you find resources or what the next step is. But I'm also the uh, founder and CEO of the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery. And we are an online trauma coaching company. And we work with clients literally all over the world. Um, at, and we really do specialize in high control religion, fundamentalism, purity culture, cults, adverse religious experiences. All of the practitioners have their own histories of it, as well as advanced trauma training, backgrounds in different mental health fields. And because it's online, it is accessible to everybody. And we really do have clients on every continent except for Antarctica. Um, and so, yeah, you can just go to traumaresolutionandrecovery.com. There's a link that says, you know, start working with a coach today. It'll direct you to a page of everybody who's available. You can do a free 20-minute phone call to see 
if they're a good fit for you. Um, and then, you know, work with them however long you would like to. But that is, uh, that's also a resource and that's traumaresolutionrecovery.com or you can find us on social media at Trauma Resolution and Recovery. I've got so much out of today. I feel like I've had a free session. Like In, in all honesty, I, I have really connected with what you've said and I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you've said as well. So I would encourage people to connect with you and whether it is personally with your services or whether it's your online resources, I think there's a lot of benefit in it and I do love the language that you speak and um, basically the grace as well, the self-forgiveness, all of that sort of stuff I think is so incredibly important and we don't employ that enough um, in our lives. So thank you, Laura, for connecting with us today. Thank you for making the time. I know it's the end of the day for you. It's the start of the day for Troy and I. I've, I've got to get to the office, but I have, I've got a lot of food for thought, which I'm going to take with me on my journey today. And I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for engaging with us and our listeners. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an awesome conversation. Awesome. Thank you. If you'd like to connect with the I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist podcast, then please see the links in our link tree in the show notes. We invite you to join our listener community on Facebook, and we're also on Instagram, X, and Reddit. Check out our merch on Redbubble. We've got t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and all kinds of great exvangelical stuff that you can wear proudly. All proceeds go to building and promoting the podcast. We want to give a huge shout out to our Patreon supporters. Subscribers get a range of benefits, including free merch, early access to episodes, access to our exclusive subscribers group, and monthly bonus content. Again, all proceeds of this go to the running and promotion cost of the podcast. A special thanks to Arva, who manages our social strategy, and also to Kerry and Bree, who manage our Facebook listener group, and also to Bree, who puts out our monthly newsletter on Substack. All of our episodes are transcribed by Leanne to increase accessibility. The show is produced and hosted by Brian McDowell and Troy Waller. The sound engineering for this episode was done by Clifford. I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist is available wherever you find your podcasts. Again, you can find all our links in our link tree in the show notes. Or why don't you pop across to our website at www.iwasateenagefundamentalist.com. Music.